This week on Jerusalem Dateline, thousands of Christians come up to Jerusalem to celebrate the biblical Feast of Tabernacles. Plus, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu addresses the UN and reveals a hidden Iranian atomic site and an ancient biblical tradition, a priestly blessing. All this and more this week on Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Julie Stahl filling in for Chris Mitchell. Thousands of Christians from around the world have come up to Jerusalem to participate in the Biblical Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot. We'll have more on the feast celebration later in our show, and we're going to take you to the Jerusalem March where many of those Christians are showing their support for Israel. But first, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu addressed the UN General Assembly in New York. He says Iran has hidden a second atomic site in Tehran and vowed that Israel would find whatever Iran hides. Just a few months after Prime Minister Netanyahu revealed that Israel had gotten a hold of secret Iranian atomic archives, he revealed a second facility. In May, we exposed the site of Iran's secret atomic archive. It's right here in the Shorabad district of Tehran. Today, I'm revealing the site of a second facility, Iran's secret atomic warehouse. It's right here in the Turku Zabad district of Tehran, just three miles away. Addressing the UN General Assembly with his classic visual aids, Netanyahu said Iran didn't destroy the sites because its goal is a nuclear weapon. In fact, it planned to use both of these sites in a few years when the time would be right to break out to the atom bomb. But ladies and gentlemen, rest assured that won't happen. It won't happen because what Iran hides, Israel will find. Iran, meanwhile, denied the allegations and said there was nothing to what the foreign minister called Netanyahu's arts and crafts show. But Netanyahu said Iran's aggression is clear in Syria, Gaza, and Lebanon, and Israel would continue to defend itself. We will continue to act against you in Syria. We will act against you in Lebanon. We will act against you in Iraq. We will act against you whenever and wherever we must act to defend our state and to defend our people. Instead of coddling Iran's dictators, join the U.S. and Israel and most of the Arab world in supporting new sanctions against a regime that endangers all of us and all of the world. Netanyahu didn't mention Russia in his speech. Russia is set to deliver a more advanced anti-aircraft missile system to Syria after Syria mistakenly shot down a Russian plane. That system could make it more difficult for Israel to prevent an Iranian military buildup inside Syria. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Trump met for the first time since the U.S. Embassy moved to Jerusalem. They were both in New York for the United Nations General Assembly. Netanyahu thanked Trump for his support for Israel's right to defend itself in a dangerous part of the world. The American-Israeli alliance has never been stronger. It's stronger than ever before under your leadership. And I look forward to working with you and your team to advance our common interests security, prosperity, and peace with Israel's neighbors and for the region. At a press conference, Trump was asked about his Israeli-Palestinian peace plan and created a stir when he seemed to publicly endorse a two-state solution for the first time. There's nothing I would rather do than see peace between Israel and the Palestinians. I like two-state solution. Yeah. That's, that's, what I think, that's what I think works best. Uh, I don't even have to speak to anybody. That's my feeling. Trump later clarified his two-state comment, saying he'd back whatever the two sides agreed on, one state or two. President Trump also addressed world leaders at the UN. While he talked about Iran, North Korea, and trade, the president also made clear his message is America first. CBN's White House correspondent Ben Kennedy brings us that story. 
In a 35-minute speech, the president covered a wide range of topics, specifically pointing out that sanctions will remain in place against North Korea until they get rid of their nuclear program. But the driving theme is how Trump will continue to put his country first. President Trump returned to the world stage, delivering his second address to the U.N. General Assembly. In it, he doubled down on the White House's policy of America first. In less than two years, my administration has accomplished more than almost any administration in the history of our country. America's so true. <laughs> Didn't expect that reaction, but that's okay. Just last year, Trump stood here calling Kim Jong-un little rocket man. Rocket man is on a suicide mission for himself. Today, he changed his tune against the rogue regime following his historic summit with the North Korean dictator. Since that meeting, we have already seen a number of encouraging measures that few could have imagined only a short time ago. The missiles and rockets are no longer flying in every direction. Nuclear testing has stopped. Trump then took aim at Iran. Iran's leaders sow chaos, death, and destruction. The U.S. responded by withdrawing from the 2015 nuclear agreement and even reinstated economic sanctions. Trump's now asking nations to join him in isolating Iran. We cannot allow a regime that chants death to America and that threatens Israel with annihilation to possess the means to deliver a nuclear warhead to any city on Earth. Just can't do it. The commander-in-chief reaffirmed support for Israel and his decision to move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. The United States is committed to a future of peace and stability in the region, including peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Trump also announced new sanctions against Venezuela and that, yes, the U.S. will respond in Syria if Bashar al-Assad uses chemical weapons again. This was no doubt a closely watched speech as Trump says the U.S. is committed to making the U.N. more effective. Ben Kennedy, CBN News, the White House. In other news, the Wall Street Journal is reporting American pastor Andrew Brunson could be released from Turkey at his next court hearing on October 12th. The nearly two-year-old saga has led to an international crisis between the two NATO allies. And as Chris Mitchell reports, there is much more at stake than just world politics. The Turkish government moved Pastor Brunson from jail to house arrest in July. Although the 50-year-old pastor has ministered in the country for more than two decades, the Turkish government charged Brunson with conspiring against President Erdogan's rule during a 2016 attempted coup. The Trump administration calls those charges bogus and has made securing Pastor Brunson's freedom a priority. I don't think there's ever been any administration, any president that has brought up a prisoner of conscience, uh, a prisoner who's in, in prison because of his faith, uh, more than any other one than President Reagan did for Natan Sharansky. So this is historic. And the Trump administration went beyond talking, leveling sanctions on Turkey that put its currency into a free fall. All of the secular media, without exception, are saying, a pastor, who cares about a pastor? Uh, the trade with Turkey is much more important. The money and the value of the lira is much more important. But the Trump administration said, no, a pastor who's falsely accused and is in prison is important to us, and we're willing to really put our uh, money where our mouths are, and they're taking a strong stand. Egyptian-born Michael Youssef says other nations are paying attention. Now, the world is watching this. They are not ignoring this. They know that they're going to be next unless they stop persecuting Christians. Franklin Graham called Christians to pray and for the U.S. to be careful. First, I would ask everybody who's watching right now, the Christians, to pray for Andrew Brunson. He's been falsely accused. This is just a sham. Turkey, we have to remember that this is a country that is fast becoming uh, a radical Islamic state. I think we need to get Brunson home, and we need to be very careful with uh, whatever we do as a country with Turkey until they change leadership and change the direction they're going. Karim says there's much more at stake than an international crisis between NATO allies. There's been many people, ourselves included, that believe God was going to do something in Izmir 
the ancient Smyrna, Izmir, where Andrew Brunson is today, that was going to impa impact not only Turkey, but all the nations around it. Because it's clear that Andrew Brunson is in, in prison or under arrest for one reason, and that's his hope and faith in Jesus Christ as the Messiah, not only of the West, but of the entire world. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Coming up, praying for what some are calling the most important elections in U.S. history. As we promised, we brought you to the Jerusalem March. But first, some political observers believe that the upcoming November elections in the U.S. Congress are some of the most important in U.S. history. Given the close ties between the U.S. and Israel, that could have an impact on the Jewish state. Here's what two American Christian leaders have to say. On November 6th, Americans will decide the makeup of the House of Representatives and the Senate for the next two years. Christian leaders Cindy Jacobs and Lance Walnow told CBN News the church can play a vital role in those elections. I think that we need to pray that God will raise up righteous leaders. We're at a tipping point for the nation. And I believe that if we do not vote righteously, if then, then we're going to see some things start unraveled. So as intercessors, we want to pray, 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 you know, that, that God will be exalted. Wall now sees freedom on the line and a time to act. We need to mobilize in our country so that we are actually able to occupy the spaces where we have freedom and push back on having those freedoms taken away. And most Christians don't want to mobilize. They don't want to be activists. But the book of Acts is about acts. Mm -hmm. And that's the root of activism. You've got to get engaged. Mm -hmm. Jacobs is mobilizing a 40-day prayer event. One thing we're doing is there's a, a group of prayer networks that we have all banded together. And we have something called Pray in Unity. The website PrayInUnity.org provides prayer guides beginning September 28th through Election Day. You can sign up, you know, prayer walk your street and, or find, find a prayer group at your church. But please pray. Pray for your family, but always pray beyond your family because your family will suffer under unrighteous administrations if you don't pray for the nation. They both agree prayer is a big step, followed by actually voting. We have to pray, but we have to mobilize and vote. And I think that sometimes we think that the prayer is a substitute for the corresponding action. And you can't hire someone else to do your civic duty. You've got to vote for the congressman that's in your district. You can vote for the senator in your state. These are um, elections right now where you have direct authority in your territory. And so this is where Christians have to show up in their own territory. You know, voting is spiritual. Voting is actually a spiritual act because we're called to steward our nations. We're called to disciple our nations. So if we vote, then we will get righteous leaders. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Coming up, Sukkot, the feast where we're commanded to rejoice. As we said earlier, Israel is celebrating the biblical feast of Sukkot, and thousands of Christians have come from around the world to celebrate with them see prophecy fulfilled, and attend the annual Feast of Tabernacles celebration. Here's more on that happy and prophetic event. It's a gala event. Christian pilgrims dressed in national costumes celebrating the feast in Jerusalem. More than 5,000 Christians from nearly 100 countries came here for the week-long celebration. They came to worship the God of Israel and stand with his people. I know it's going to be a life-changing experience, and I love Israel, and I think that this is a time that um, things are going to turn around, and it's very prophetic. They're following the invitation of Zechariah 14, which says one day all the nations will come up to celebrate this biblical feast here in Jerusalem to worship the Lord and keep the Feast of Tabernacles, and we're showing up now as, as a, a statement of faith that that day is coming when the Messiah will rule here. David Parsons of the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem says this year's theme, Dare to Dream, comes from Psalm 126. 
When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like those that dream. And it's about the dream of Israel, all those centuries of being restored back to the land, ending the exile, coming back here. And we live in the day of Israel's restoration. Israel is now 70 years old as a reborn state. And there's much to celebrate. They've overcome many wars, terror attacks, rocket barrages, economic boycotts, other attempts to strangle it. As part of this year's celebration, people are getting the CBN documentary, To Life, How Israeli Volunteers Are Changing the World. The film shows how Israel works to be among the first to respond to disasters and needs around the world. And we're very uh, happy that all the Feast Pilgrims are going to go back with copies of it in English. And we're partnering with CBN to also provide Hebrew copies to all Israeli guests through the Feast this week. And Christians are glad to be here. It's great. It's, it's, it's a part of the prophetic um, words from the Bible. We've just been studying the things in the Bible that talks about how Jerusalem is going to be restored and Israel is going to be restored. And we want to be part of that. It's amazing. I am really delighted and thrilled to what I have been witness since yesterday evening and I think I take with me a commitment to now pray more for Israel, for the peace of Israel, of Jerusalem and even do more and uh, mobilize more people to also work towards the peace of, of Israel. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. For thousands of years, the Jewish people have followed the biblical injunction to live in temporary dwellings during the Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot. Here's a story we did earlier. We want to take you for a look inside one of those sukkahs so you can hear just how it brings Jewish people closer to God. Some call him Hashem. It's an ancient biblical commandment that's still being kept today. Some call it a Jewish camping trip but with the conveniences of home. Shalom. Hi, Shalom. Welcome. Shalom. So glad thank to have you. you here with us in our sukkah. Yes, thank you. We're here in our sukkah, which is really the, the home away from homes for this whole week of uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot. Like many Israelis and Jewish people around the world, Seth and Teina Ben Chaim build a sukkah or booth on the back porch of their Jerusalem apartment every year. It helps us remember, first of all, we're commanded to remember the exodus from Egypt and how we needed to uh, wander through the desert for 40 years without permanent dwellings. But it also reminds us that even though we've been brought into the land of Israel, we haven't reached our final destination. So tell us about the sukkah itself. What, what do you, how do you make a sukkah? And the main thing is that it's a roof that will uh, make us feel that we're open to the elements. Uh -huh. And then we and need to... why is that? Well, uh, because otherwise we'd be in the protection of our homes in some ways. And, uh, and we're supposed to be in this flimsy tabernacle uh, so that we can remember that ultimately we're under Hashem's uh, protection. Most sukkahs are decorated at least in part by the children. Families eat, sleep, study, and play together in their temporary houses for a whole week. Despite the camping conditions, it's considered a joyful time. And, and you can focus on the real important things like relationships and, uh, and just sitting down and studying the word and talking with the, the children about God's faithfulness. Jonathan and his sister Rebecca enjoy the holiday so much, Jonathan made his treehouse into a sukkah. This was Sukkot. This was Sukkot. And that too. That's very pretty. So you decorated your sukkah up here. Yes. Another part of the Sukkot celebration, recorded in Leviticus 23, is bringing a special fruit and branches to rejoice before the Lord. We offer them to Hashem, all four of these, in our uh, prayers. Every morning we wave them in many different directions and we, uh, we really look to above. And that's what this type of roof helps us remember too, is we're looking to above because that's where our help is going to come from. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. Still ahead, an ancient biblical tradition, the priestly blessing. Thousands of Israelis and Jews from around the world, as well as Christians, packed the Western Wall Plaza to participate in an ancient biblical tradition. Take a look. You.
It's called the Birkat HaKohanim, or priestly blessing. If you're a man or a woman of faith, the, those blessings have supernatural powers, uh -huh. especially when you have such a large group together of the people of Israel and the priests. In the book of Numbers, God commands Moses and Aaron to bless the children of Israel. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. The Aaronic benediction or blessing is part of Jewish prayers every day in Israel. But during Sukkot, Jewish people gather from around the world at the Western Wall to give and receive this ancient blessing. Jewish men who are believed to be of the priestly line come to bless the people of Israel. It's an honor because I myself am a Kohen. I'm going to be the one um, that's going to be blessing everyone. If, uh... Like, for example, today I was all the way up front by the wall, blessing everyone under my talus. And the more that come to bless and be blessed, the better. They pray for all the uh, Jewish people of all the world, uh -huh. for peace and uh, good things, good yeah. things. Jewish people come for the priestly blessing on the Feast of Tabernacles, and we pray, and we hope that our prayers will ascend to heaven. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. That's it for this edition. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. I'm Julie Stahl. We'll leave you this week with more sights and sounds of the Jerusalem March. And we'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline. We